Welcome, you're watching Head to Head. I'm Antonina Antosha with UATV. Today, we're talking about the future of gas transit operations after 2019, when the existing agreements between Ukraine and Russia expire. The issue was repeatedly discussed in format of trilateral talks between the representatives of EU, Ukraine and Russia in Brussels, with the next round of negotiations scheduled for September 26th. So which decision would be most beneficial for Ukraine? To talk more about this, we're joined in the studio today by Andrian Prokip, energy expert at the Ukrainian Institute for the Future. Hello and thank you for joining us today. Hello. So, as I have already mentioned, next year uh, the existing agreements between Russia and Ukraine expire. But And there is an issue of gas transit across Ukraine that is being aroused. Could you comment? Well, currently it's rather difficult to... Uh, make any focus about the future of the, the next construct, but uh, at least uh, Ukraine has one strong position, is that there are still no extra capacities to transmit Russian gas uh, to Europe, uh, but only Ukrainian route. So uh, this means that Ukraine can make some kind of dip diplomatic pressure on the European Union and to meet all those requirements that Ukraine has. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the first issue, but uh, the, the, weak, uh, the weakness of Ukraine in this case is that Europeans expect from Ukraine to uh, conduct energy uh, gas reform. So that means that Ukrainian gas markets operate f uh, absolutely in accordance to European rules. And that means also that uh, Ukrainian uh, state-owned naftahouse house company should be unbundled or should be ready for unbundling. So uh, I, I think uh, Europeans will pay a lot of attention to, uh, to our success. So we, we still uh, have a lot to do with this uh, and we still have good chances to, to sign, a, I think, even long-term contract, uh, about 10 or 20 years uh, long contract to transmit uh, gas from Russia to European Union. Contract with Russia, you mean, right? Uh, well, it's mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, for Ukraine, uh, it's better to have contract with the European Union, or uh, if uh, Europeans have the contract directly with Russia and gas is traded at the eastern uh, border uh, um, of Ukraine. So that means that Ukraine will be more protected. <clears throat> but uh, it's unlikely that until we have fully reformed gas market, that we will have. Uh, this scenario that European Union signs agreement with Russia and uh, Ukraine is protected. Let's talk numbers here. Uh, in the in the um, in the last deal between Ukraine and IMF, mm -hmm. there was a condition that the tariffs yeah. on gas right. for the population of Ukraine is to be risen. Now, if we're talking about the gas transition throughout Ukraine, what kind of tariff could we be talking about in this sphere? Well, that's, uh, that's also is, uh, an issue for negotiation between for three parties. And so um, that, that depends on the volumes that will be uh, pumped through Ukraine and that depends uh, on the methodology that Ukraine will choose. So uh, currently, uh, Naftahas want to use this European practice uh, for paying for each uh, uh, in and out point uh, of the gas transmit system. So uh, the, the same, uh, I think it's, it's just a small, um, small part of a big puzzle of negotiation. And, uh, you know, uh, I think that uh, discussing the price for transit is not so uh, important as just saving the transit and saving the importance of Ukrainian gas transmission system. Speaking of negotiations, uh, how, how can we be sure that Russia is to be trusted in this process and not demand um, any kind of uh, special deal and not meaning only gas? We all know that we have the joint forces operation mm -hmm. going on in the east of Ukraine. There is a war. Mm -hmm. for the fifth consecutive sure. year, and Russia is the aggressor. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, it's rather difficult to trust Russia, uh, but, uh, you know, th th there are some examples in history, I mean, in Ukraine-Russia, I guess, uh, relations history, uh, when Russia couldn't break uh, agreements, and that was like, uh, the, mm, that was the case of bundling a price for, for, for gas and uh, for uh, gas transit. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, <clears throat> I think if we have a good contract uh, and European Union guarantees this contract, uh, we can protect Ukrainian transit because it's, it's extremely important uh, uh, in the case if Nord Stream 2 is built and Tech Stream is built. And we can exclude new pipelines bypassing Ukraine as well. 
Okay, speaking of Nord Stream 2, there, this is the project that has caused a lot of controversy throughout the yep. world. It has been one of the, the hottest topics for discussions throughout European Union in the United States and Ukraine. Um, nevertheless, Germany has stated that it supports the project. Now, does this mean that in this case scenario, Berlin is just um, taking care of its own economical benefits rather than political um, unity of the European Union? Well, actually, they do. Uh, the first uh, point is that Germany is one of the most powerful countries in the European Union and uh, it and Germany impacts on the position of the European Union and Germany grants a lot of money to European budget. Uh, to, uh, and having the Nord Stream 2 means uh, making more money for German economy uh, because uh, German will, will become like the most gas uh, hub uh, in mm -hmm. the European Union. Um, sure, it's, it's much more interesting to receive money themselves rather than paying for transit to, to Ukraine. And uh, uh, another important reason that German companies inv are investing in Austrian too. And another uh, important reason is that German and Austrian companies uh, invested in gas extraction in Russia. So uh, this gas partly owned by Austria and Germany uh, will be translated through the pipeline partly owned by, uh, by uh, Austria and Germany, and they will be uh, transmitted in the European Union. So that, that's, that's the logic of, of Germany. Uh, some Ukrainian officials have voiced uh, such a statement is that if the Nord Stream 2 pipeline project is implemented and is supported by Germany and Ukraine, then Ukraine should be having guarantees from Germany. What kind of guarantees are we talking about? Uh, well, uh, that's about guarantees of usage of Ukrainian gas transit. So uh, the, the problem is that uh, Ukrainian officials, for instance, a Minister for Energy, Nasalik, he said that we should pump not less than 40 billion cubic meters annually, uh, not to have losses. So, uh, the, well, a good option is to have 60 billion cubic meters. Uh, but um, so, and, and that is the matter of negotiation, of possible negotiation, because uh, um, German Minister for Economy, for Economics, uh, so he came to Moscow, he came to Kiev, he tried to make this negotiation, but but actually those failed, because uh, Ukrainian official position is to have more than 60. It's, it's about having 90, like we had 90, uh, last year we had 93.5, and. Uh, Another part of Ukraine's position is prohibiting and halting uh, the Nord Stream 2. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but uh, so Germans uh, propose to to have like for Ukraine to have a long-term contract with Russia and European Union uh, to pump uh, um, some deafening volume, like 40 or 60. And sure, like uh, Russians were talking about 10 or 15, but it's it's actually unacceptable for Ukraine. Uh, Russia did not show up for the previous round of negotiations of the, of the trilateral uh, group that was scheduled on September 12th and 13th. Now, what could this mean? Could this be a so-called message from the Kremlin to Kiev? Well, yes, it, it's just, just a part of big gamble Russia plays uh, to demonstrate that, hey guys, uh, just negotiate, but uh, we are rather important, enough important to uh, uh, to impact on your negotiations at the last stage. So, but I, I think it's just a, a muscle playing that Russia does all the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, because uh, sure, uh, European Union is dependent on Russian gas, but Russia is dependent on, uh, on incomes that European Union gains from, uh, that, that gives to Russia. And uh, in, in the case, if Russia behaves not well, uh, sure, the European Union uh, will change its strategy about uh, future energy supplies in next 10 or 20 years. So they will be less interested in uh, Russian uh, energy supplies. Hypothetically, Ukrainian energy sector, could it become fully independent? Yeah, right. Uh, it, it can be. Uh, first of all, it's about uh, increasing of uh, domestic gas production. So we, we can is there a formula? Is there a, a, a universal formula that this independency could be reached? Yeah, that there is. It's uh, it's a hundred percent self-sufficiency for, uh, for all energy sources used, and it's having modern energy sector. I mean that. Um, a lot of our assets are obsolete and we like need to renew it, we need to reinvest and that means that we have to conduct 
reforms to make uh, these energy uh, companies more profitable, to make them uh, make possibilities for them to invest in in their assets. So uh, investing in uh, energy production domestically mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and investing in assets and increasing uh, enhancing energy efficiency. That's that's a uh, easy but a long-standing way for uh, energy independence, I would say. However, in the long-term perspective, would it be more effective for Ukraine's economy? Uh, yeah, yeah, it will be more effective, sure, because uh, we have we may have chances uh, pay less. I mean, like in the scope of the whole country, mm -hmm. to pay less for energy. Uh, we will be less dependent uh, geopolitically from, from uh, energy suppliers. Uh, so those uh, main two reasons which uh, self-sufficiency and in, uh, energy dependence is more efficient option for Ukraine rather than, than any other. Here's a goal to strive for. Thank you so much for coming Thank and clarifying you. this all for us. That was Andrian Prokip. He is an energy expert at the Ukrainian Institute for the Future. Thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned with UATV for more.